Hello everyone, this is Alice at Welding and today I have the pleasure of talking to Gabriella Brown, who is a workplace consultant and a coach. She is also the author of All That We Are, which is a series of case studies all about our working lives. So thank you, Gabriella, and maybe you could start by just introducing uh, your background and what brought you to writing this book. Thank you very much, Alice, and thank you for inviting me to be on this podcast. It's great. Um, so my background originally, I'll say something about my personal background in a minute because that has an influence on the book, but my career background is that I started in education and training. Um, like a lot of people in those days, and this is a long time ago, I would be, worked my way to being a manager and a leader with absolutely no training in doing that and no coaching. Coaching didn't exist in those days and no support. And I didn't really have a clue. And I became a leader in an organization that restructured, relocated, did everything rather terribly. Um, and I got incredibly stressed. I, I had a brand new team who didn't know anything and I got really stressed and found the whole thing really difficult. Mm -hmm. I think that also set the seeds for the book because I couldn't understand half of what was going on in the organization. There were so many emotions flooding around and flooding in me and I couldn't make head or tail of them. Mm -hmm. So I, I ended up um, I had a national position for a national awarding body. Um, I ended up going freelance, doing some fantastic work in Eastern Europe, developing education systems and qualifications. Um, and But I really yearned for something that went deeper. And I think it was my experience of not understanding mm. and having had the contrast between loving being a member of a team and hating being a leader. Um, I wanted something that went deeper. So I started training and I did a master's degree at the Tavistock, which was psychoanalytic approaches to consulting to organizations. And I also went into analysis as a patient and that particularly my own analysis and also the masters really changed my outlook and thinking. And that took me to where I am now. Um, and my, my background, which comes, which I have written about in the book, to my surprise, actually, I didn't intend to. And I found in the end that I needed to also, or it's helpful to say some personal things. So I'm, my family immigrated to this country when I was a baby. When people meet me, see me, hear me, I'm not someone, apart from the slight giveaway of my name, I'm not someone you'd ever think of as an immigrant. It, it's very hidden, but it is very present in me and my family. And my parents had strong foreign accents. They didn't understand how things worked in this country. Mm. We moved a lot. I kept going to different schools. And all of that really impacted on me as a person and I think shaped why I do what I do mm -hmm. and also is shaped some of the way I wrote the book, All That We Are. Mm -hmm. And even the title, All That We Are. You know, mm -hmm. we bring all that we are to work even though we kid ourselves that we leave some of it behind. You know, we believe, oh, emotions and everything they don't we leave them outside when we go into work or join the virtual space for work but of course we can't mm. and our personal backgrounds and histories and our feelings all are there with us yes. thank you for sharing that and so how how can you apply that kind of psychoanalytic theory and thinking to workplaces then i think the the starting place for me that gets left out of workplace thinking almost entirely is that we have an unconscious. I mean, some people would disagree, but I firmly believe, and I think there's a ton of evidence to show that we have an unconscious. 
it comes out in all sorts of ways. You know, dreams come from the unconscious, slips of the tongue are unconscious. Um, you notice really small things in the workplace about who sits next to who. There's research, isn't there, about women having their periods at similar times. How do those things start sinking? It's unconscious processes that are going on. So I think the first thing is for organisations to realise that there's a lot going on that's out of sight. Um, and it's not all rational. And if they can think that there may be other stuff going on and they can take that seriously, mm -hmm. I think that's the starting place for how we can apply this. So we pay attention. We don't, if we're feeling strong emotions, for better or worse about something, we don't try and push them away, which mostly we do try to do at work but we actually pay attention to them. We take them as data. We may not necessarily act on them, but they are information. They're telling us something about what may be going on, not just in us, but generally in that workplace. So I'd say that's the starting place to recognise that there's much more going on than we can at first see. And things like sibling rivalry, which we don't we think of so commonly in, in the family now. Mm -hmm. um, we don't think of it in the workplace. I've never found an organisation where it doesn't exist. And really, why wouldn't it? Because of course we bring that in mm -hmm. from our backgrounds. Of course we do. So that's for me the starting application, that there's the irrational, however much we try and be rational. There's the emotional, however much we try to keep that out and there's the unconscious however much we try to ignore it and I think we ignore all of these things at our peril yeah it's fascinating and what about attachment styles then okay well good question and that of course is a part of psychoanalytic thinking um so attachment theory was developed by John Bowlby a very long time ago and he had the idea that we're, the child needs its carer's presence as much as it needs food. Mm. So the need to be close to somebody is as basic as the need to eat. Um, and we form as children different patterns of attaching to our main caregivers those who you know most important in our lives most of us that's our parents and we form a secure attachment or an insecure attachment so if we if our parents have been able and they're this is not about blaming parents if they haven't been able because there can be all sorts of reasons why parents can't do this if they're refugees if they're struggling with cost of living crisis if they're made redundant you know all of those things that are difficult then the parent may not be as available to their child as they otherwise would be or would like to be and they may not be as reliable as the child needs them to be so if they become unreliable and inconsistent if there are a lot of separations if the child's sent away often to stay with other people um, the child gets insecure about that care from that parent if the parent manages to stay reliable the child has a sense of just believing in being loved and looked after and believing in their place in the family and the world that gives them a greater capacity for trust. And in the organisation, it actually has a huge impact because people with secure attachments don't have to worry so much. They kind of take it as a given that they belong there and things are relatively benign. Mm. Those with insecure attachments, and there are different patterns of that, but they it's not that they can't do well at work. They can do extremely well. And many of them have insecure attachments. But we have to work much harder at 
trust that comes harder to us we'll be more suspicious um if there's significant change in the organization we will be more anxious and like children when they're when their main caregiver goes they might get very clingy mm. or they might do the opposite which is avoid being too close because they've learned that that doesn't work they're not going to get their needs met so they don't attach they avoid that and then we will replicate that at work so things are difficult we might kind of withdraw or we might cling and annoy our leaders because they're not recognizing what's going on we put a lot of energy into managing our insecurity so it makes the workplace harder for us so the family is the first group and then it exactly. replicates in other groups, including the workplace. Exactly that. Mm -hmm. And for most of us, our parents are our first authority figures. Mm -hmm. That replicates in other groups. Um, at school, in how we relate to teachers and at work in how we relate to bosses. And it's not conscious. That's another thing about applying the unconscious uh, to the workplace. It's not conscious, but as bosses we might get things from our staff from some staff that we can't begin to understand why on earth they're behaving to us like that mm. it might be that in their minds we are a certain we're a bit of a replica mm. of some leftover difficulty with a parent and we we're not aware as the employee that that's how we're relating to the boss and the boss doesn't understand it but it's there going on and so what are the most common pitfalls you think people have in the workplace in terms of their confidence or abilities? Um, well, I think attachment is one pitfall, but I think, I think actually broader than that is the fact that we don't take human nature seriously and we're not aware enough of our own trigger points or of what might trigger yeah. other people. Um, so I think the pitfalls are that we don't, we're frightened of difficult conversations because when things get difficult, we, we often need a conversation that can feel as if it will be very difficult. Might not be, yeah. um, but we're very frightened. We keep away from that. We're frightened of our irrational selves. So we keep away from that. And these things get us into trouble. I mean, a, a small, a couple of examples from, from the book. One example is about somebody who was actually very envious, but didn't know it. And it kept getting him into trouble because mm -hmm. he couldn't bear the achievements of other people. So that got him into other in, into difficulty. Another example would be about um, a team that goes into a disturbed state of mind and doesn't understand it, but is completely, they're working very hard, but they're completely off task. I mean, one that I'm thinking of in the book is the chapters called Loss, Losing Agency. Mm -hmm. And they just can't figure out what to do. They can't think. They've gone into a very dependent state of mind. So that those are pitfalls about what happens to us commonly, ordinarily, in work under stress. And the, the fact that we don't recognise, that's the real pitfall, that we don't recognise that yeah. those are going on. So we don't make space to deal with them and we avoid them. Yeah, so the, the key really for employers and employees is that the more self-awareness you have, the better your working life will be. That is absolutely right. Self-awareness is hugely important mm -hmm. um, and hugely helpful. I think the other bit that goes in tandem with it is also being aware of others. Mm -hmm. So and also being aware of your impact on them, which is part of self-awareness, but being aware of their impact on you. Mm -hmm. So trying to 
figure out, oh God, I behaved like that to my colleague because she bloody reminds me of my incredibly annoying sister or whatever it is, you know, but trying to be aware or or maybe I'm annoying them or this is what's happening in this group or maybe my boss is very anxious actually mm -hmm. and under a lot of stress. It's awareness of others as well as awareness of self. And awareness that not everything we do is rational. Yes. And uh, so how, how would people get there? Is this somewhere like therapy or coaching might come in? And do you see one as being better than the other? Or what's the difference in your mind? Good question. Um, I think they can come in, but they don't necessarily have to. I'll, I'll say in a moment what I think the difference is, but I think... What people can do for themselves, the self-awareness bit, is to really try and stand back a bit and look at yourself as if you're watching yourself as an observer and watch your reactions, notice your reactions and interrogate yourself. I don't mean that in a nasty way. I mean, really try and think, what, what was going on with me at that moment? Why did I react today like that? Whereas yesterday the same thing happened and I was fine about it. Or why do I react fine to that person and not to this person? What what might this be about for me? And we can just let our minds randomly wonder to what might be going on. I think that's a very good starting place and really try to reflect and think rather than just behave. So it's stepping back and thinking and reflecting. And I think then in a team, it's making space to actually have conversations that are not just on the business agenda, but are a bit more personal. And I don't mean turning the workplace into a therapy place, it's not. But I do mean checking in with each other, not just, you all right? Yeah. But actually meaning it, you know, actually checking in with how people are and actually giving a bit of space, unscripted, unagended space to think about how are we as a team? How are we functioning? What are our preoccupations? What's happening with us as a collective? What's happening with us as individuals? So I think you can start to do that and also being able, daring to say some slightly difficult things if you need to, like, actually, I'm really worried about this or actually I'm upset about that. And that, that can feel difficult and everybody has to do it in a way that feels okay. And obviously you don't want to madly expose yourself in the workplace, but those things can be incredibly helpful. Allowing yourself and your team to be a bit vulnerable. Mm so important and so helpful so i'd say that's the starting point would you suggest that sorry gabriella would you suggest that employers as well then leaders of teams maybe leading by example in that respect absolutely yes absolutely yes there's one chapter in the book where the leader i thought they were so impressive because they were going through a horrendous time the organization was being closed down mm. um and in the end, they they tried like mad to prevent it. They really, really tried to fight for the organization's survival. And while they were fighting, they didn't tell their staff what was going on. Mm -hmm. And then eventually they couldn't do anything. And staff, they told staff, staff were made redundant. Staff were in huge distress. And, they, and I was working with them at and running a group once a month with all the staff and the leaders. It was quite a small organization. And at this one session, the staff said to the leaders, why didn't you tell us sooner? Why didn't you tell us this was going on? And the leaders said, we thought we could, we were trying to protect you. And we thought that was best. And one of them said to the chief exec, I now don't know if that was best to you. And the chief exec said, no, I, I thought it was at the time. And now I really don't know. 
and I'm sorry if I got it wrong. And I thought, how impressive. You're showing your uncertainty. You're showing your vulnerability. You're not bursting into tears and being inappropriately vulnerable with your team, but you are showing vulnerability. And I thought that was actually incredibly strong and impressive leadership. Mm. And the team really, you could see them change their response. You know, you could see them soften towards their leaders thinking, okay, maybe they did get it wrong, but they tried. They mm. meant it. it wasn't the lie. And for you, what is the difference between therapy and coaching? If right. someone could go and see one. Yes. Okay. So therapy, well, there are loads of different types of therapy. So if you go to psychoanalytic therapy, it's one thing. If you go to CBT, it's an entirely different thing. But if you, CBT is very good for things like trying to break habit, you know, mm -hmm. um, it can be really effective for that. I don't think it is effective for deep-seated long-term issues. It can help for a moment or a bit, and then they'll come back, and research shows that. But if you go to therapy that is trying to deal with those long-seated things in a different way, it is trying to help you resolve conflicts from your past and in your inner world in your in your mind coaching isn't trying to do that a lot of coaching won't go into the past i'm i'm different because of my approach because i use psychoanalytic thinking and i use systems thinking but i i will ask people about their family history because because of what i've said it comes with us to work but in asking about it, I'm trying to help that person and me be able to see and understand together what's happening to them in the workplace. I'm not trying to therapeutically resolve what happens in their childhood, whereas therapy is. But if it's coaching for the workplace, the goal is the present and the future. And for me, that can't be looked at without thinking about the past. But it's not in order to resolve the past, it's in order to illuminate the present and understand it and disentangle them because we can get them very tangled up in our minds. Like if we realize I'm so upset about this in work, I realize I am being a bit, I might be over egging this a bit. Mm -hmm. And that might be about our past in our family. It might be. One of the characters in my book got very paranoid thinking someone was trying to get rid of him. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, that came from having been made redundant in the past and being extremely worried about that happening again. So if, if we can make those connections, we can disentangle some of our past experience from what's happening at the moment. Thank you so much, Gabriella, for your insights. It's great to talk to you. Oh, it's great to talk to you yeah. too. Thank, thank you so you. much. Okay, thank you very much for having me.